Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority, where this week we're going to be talking about the authority of the Holy Bible. Um, so, you know, this is a, a, a series about authors and about literature. So you might think it's a little bit odd that we're going to have a, an episode on the Bible. In, in terms of importance, of course, it should have come first. Uh, but we've we've been doing this at, the, at least at the moment. We're going through a little history of Western civilization, um, so beginning with the earliest uh, great epics of, of of Western literature by Homer, uh, and taking things chronologically, then Sophocles, and then uh, last last time we did Virgil. But so now, in terms of chronology, you know, the, the Bible is something which was born out of the gospel, born out of the incarnation about uh, God becoming man. Uh, so we, we, we need to uh, talk about the centrality of the Bible uh, as a text, but also as a literary text, not, not just a, an historical text so, um, or a theological text or philosophical text. It's also a literary text, as we shall see. So we've mentioned in previous episodes about the virgin muse uh, uh, awaiting the bridegroom. Well, with the coming of Christ, the virgin muse meets the bridegroom, right? The marriage is consummated. In, in, in the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ, the founding of his church, the mystical body, which continues to be his incarnation uh, mystically throughout the centuries thereafter. So what we see is the virgin muse, in some sense, Jerusalem, the, the, the faith of the virgin awaiting the coming of the Messiah right? the, in the covenant being fulfilled in the marriage uh, with the bridegroom, with the coming of Christ. So that's Jerusalem. And then Athens, the path of reason, uh, the, the great Greek philosophers, uh, the path of storytelling um, with, with, uh, with, with both the, uh, the epics of Homer and, and, the, and, the, and the plays of, 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 of such as Sophocles that we've, we've discussed. And then they come together, uh, the faith of Jerusalem and the reason and myth of Athens come together in Rome, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, as the synthesis, the marriage, not just of the bride and the bridegroom, but through that marriage, uh, the marriage of faith and reason, where faith and reason are now melded together they come together. Um, they're no longer seen as being uh, in, in conflict or uh, as being distinct. They are basically synthesized in the person of Jesus Christ and in the teaching of his church. Now, the Holy Bible, of course, is, uh, is um, uh, the author. So therefore, the authority is God himself, the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, but it was, if you like... Uh, what was canonical, what was put into the Bible as as seen as being definitive and true, was a decision of the mystical body of Jesus Christ, which is the Catholic Church. It was the Catholic Church that decided in the early years of the church, um, certainly by, by, by the first, second century, um, which books were canonical, which ones were more authentically the, uh, the voice of God and which were not. So we have this authority, both ultimately of, of the, the word of God himself in the words of the Bible, um, uh, the Holy Spirit as being the one who inspired, uh, for instance, the gospel, the writers of the gospel and, 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 and the other books of the Bible. Um, but also this understanding of the authority to bind what's bound on earth and loose what's loosed, uh, uh, what's bound on earth, we bound in heaven, what's loosed on earth, we loosed in heaven. That power which Christ gives to his mystical body, the church, is actually the authority by which we get uh, what is the Holy Bible, right? So, if you, so we have this, uh, the Holy Spirit 
in league with the mystical body of Jesus Christ, the church. And that's how we know what, what is authentically part of holy scripture, right? The Holy Spirit inspiring human writers um, in, a, in an infallible way. Now, I talked about the Bible being a, a literary text, right? It's a work of literature. And, and, and we're going to get scandalized if you think literature means nonfiction and nonfiction means something which is not true. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, that's what we're going to discuss now about that's not what literature is. You know, it's not something which is not true. I mean, it can be. Um, we have bad, bad f philosophy means philosophia, the love of wisdom. Uh, but uh, something could be a philosophy which is leading people astray. Karl Marx, for instance, Marxism, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. So you have philosophy which 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 is evil um, that doesn't teach people the truth, but on the contrary teaches them error. You have theology which teaches people error. That's called heresy. So literature can either be either be reflect the truth um, uh, uh, or it cannot. Just like just like theology or philosophy. So the Bible as a literary text, first of all, is historical narrative. Uh, it, but the Bible's different, different genre, right? It's not just one genre. So there's historical narrative, right? The, 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 but the historical narrative is itself a narrative. Even if it's factually true, it's still a story that unfolds. History is a story. History is his story, uh, in which he is at weaving facts to ultimately bring about his providential design. So, so it's a historical narrative. They're also it can, it's, it's a song book. You know, the the book of Psalms uh, are, are are songs. The Song of Songs. There are mystery stories. The Book of Job um, is a mystery story. Uh, there are fictional narratives within it. Um, so fictional narratives. Uh, is there fiction in the Bible? You bet. And I'll give you an example. Um, when Jesus Christ uh, teaches some of his most powerful lessons through the telling of fictional stories. It should not be called scandal if I would say to you that the prodigal son never existed. The prodigal son is a product of our Lord's divine imagination. Uh, the prodigal son is a, a figment of Christ's imagination, his brother, his father, the servants, the pigs. It's a fictional narrative. And yet that story, although it never took place in history, is so true that every time anybody has heard that story or read that story in the 2,000 years since it was first told, does not say the prodigal son is like me. We say that we are like the prodigal son. So Paradoxically, this fictional character who never existed in history is more real as an archetype uh, of, of, of the repentant sinner who returns to the father, uh, and of, of which we are only types. That's the archetype. We are types. We are, we are types of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is the real thing told by Christ in the story. So th this is a, an example of the power of fictional narratives used by Christ himself in scripture through the telling of parables. One of the most powerful ways that he tell teaches us lessons is through the telling of fictional stories. And then, of course, there's Proverbs. There's a book of Proverbs. There's, uh, there's something which might almost be seen as surreal, a dreamscape in, 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 in the apocalypse, in the, in the book of Revelation. So the, the Bible is, is, a, is a whole collection of different literary genres um, forged together by the will of God uh, as the word of God. Now, how do we read the Bible? Well, insofar as the Bible is a literary text, it has to be read literarily and not merely literally. And you don't have to take my word for that. Take the two greatest doctors of the church, St. Augustinus and Thomas Aquinas, and what they teach about this. And this is... Um, this is something we really do have to understand. So in uh, his uh, uh, in his book, De Doctrina Christiana, uh, uh, of, of Christian doctrine, St. Augustine says that we, we perceive reality through signs. And a sign is something which signifies, right? It's, it's something which, which signifies something else. Um, and the word allegory, by the way, is also yeah, from allegoros in Greek, uh, means a, a thing that points to something else. 
So the, 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 you could say that a sign and an allegory are synonyms, right? They they mean essentially the same thing. A thing which points to something beyond itself. So uh, St. Augustine gives some examples of what he calls natural signs, signs that, that, that exist in nature that we read. We have to read the sign to see the truth that, that, that we can't actually see directly. So he uses the example of, uh, of uh, smoke, that when we see smoke, we don't see fire, but we know that smoke signifies fire, and therefore we do see fire in the sense that we know that where there's smoke, there is fire. Even if we can't physically see it, we know, we can we see it now in our mind's eye. We should have mentioned here, by the way, that the, the imagination, this is important for us to know, we're made in the, in the image of God. We are the Imago Dei. And what does that mean? I mean, in some sense, um, everything that God makes is made in the image of God, right? They're, 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 they're the fruits of his creativity. So a horse is made in the image of God because God created it from his own mind, right? He thought of it and thought it into being, brings it into being. So a horse is made in the image of God in that sense. But what we made in the image of God in a much deeper sense. Uh, we are divine in some sense, in, 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 in a way which the other creatures are not. And so how do we detect that? We detect that by looking what it is in us that we don't see in the other creatures. Uh, and but ultimately, we see the good, the true, and the beautiful, uh, the goodness of love, <clears throat> uh, the, the the truth of reason, and the beauty of creativity and creation. So the good, the true, and the beautiful. So these ancient Greek understandings of transcendentals, these three things that are really one, so a, they're triune, they're a trinity, as an image of the divine, um, the image of God. So let's, uh, when Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he is saying, I am the good, the true, and the beautiful. I am the way of goodness, love. I am the, uh, the truth of the true, the truth of reason, uh, the, the source of reason and, and where reason leads, leads back to. And, uh, and I am the life. Because beauty is the life in things. If 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 we don't see the beauty, it's, it's not the life in things necessarily biologically. By the way, uh, it's not that sort of. It's not merely biological. It's 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 the life of God in things. So if we don't see the beauty of a sunrise, I mean, there's, there's nothing biological in in the beauty of the sunrise. It's it's physical matter or inorganic matter. You know, light going through the atmosphere, etc., and the sun. If we don't see the beauty of that is not because it's not beautiful because there's a life in it uh, which is the life of creation that god has, has has breathed his life of beauty into that and if we don't see it it's because we are dead right we are not alive to the life in it so this uh, uh beauty is not in the eye of the beholder it's in the thing beheld. If we don't behold the beauty, it's because we're blind. So uh, so this is very important. So the way, the truth, and the life is the good, the true, and the beautiful. So how does that manifest itself in us as the Imago Dei? Well, we have to be able to be good as God is good. We have to be able to love um, the way of goodness. We have to be true as God is true by, by, by being true to reason, to the Logos, um, reason himself. And we have to be beautiful we have to uh, um, have the life of beauty in us, both by seeing the beauty of creation, but also then producing that beauty creatively by using our own creative gifts. Unlike all the other creatures, we can love, we can reason, and we can create. We are creators. So these are m marks of God. Another one, by the way, is, is we can laugh, but that's another subject. Only uh, humor is something also which is part of the divine image in us. So uh, now we understand the imagination as part of the divine image, the Imago Dei in us, the imagination. We, we can see that we're meant to see the, the goodness, truth, and beauty of reality imaginatively, right? By using imagination. And one way we do that is to see not just the thing literally, but the thing it signifies. So we see smoke and we use our imagination and we see the presence of fire. Uh, even if we can't physically see it. Another example St. Augustine gives is animal tracks. Now, literally speaking, an animal track is a shape, an indented shape in the mud. That's what it is, literally. 
but it signifies the fact that a certain type of animal, and if you know the shape, uh, you can read the sign, right? That the, the sign signifies which which animal, what sort of animal walked past here. And if you're good at reading the signs and the, the soil and what have you, you can probably work out how long ago it was um, and whether it was running or walking. Um, so you animal signs uh, as another natural sign. But then he said there are conventional signs. These are signs which we create um, to signify other things. And the most commonly used creative signs uh, are conventional signs, to use Augustine's words, are words, what we're doing now. If, um, if we don't read the sign, um, we will not understand what it signifies. So for instance, if you do not speak English and I use a word such as dog, you it would just sound like a monosyllabic noise or grunt um, if you read the signs if you speak the language you will have an image presented into your mind by that verbal sign i've made of a four-legged canine if i reverse the letters uh letters are also signs as words are uh, the, 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 the components by which we make the word if we reverse that instead of having dog we have god we see something at least hopefully very different from a four-legged canine mammal um so this is conventional signs the most common conventional signs are words every word is not the literal thing it's not the sound or the visual thing it signifies something beyond itself it's an allegory something which signifies something beyond itself so we can't even think because we think by using words we can't even communicate to ourselves through thoughts, let alone to other people through words, without reading the signs. So we have to be literary and not merely literal. Now, Thomas Aquinas takes things further when talking about the Bible. He says the Bible has four distinct levels of meaning. One level is the literal meaning. And the other three are three different types of allegorical meaning. And bearing in mind that, 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 that Thomas Aquinas is the angelic doctor, he's the greatest and most authoritative authority uh, in terms of theology, uh, we should be listening to him. This is the way the church reads the Bible. It's the way that God intends us to read the Bible. One literal level, three allegorical levels. So the literal level is the literal meaning of the words. I mean, obviously you have to understand the literal meaning of the words, um, what's happening, what's being said. But he said the next level of meaning uh, is, is the allegorical level. And that is how the Old Testament serves as a prefigurement of the New Testament. In other words, I talked about the virgin muse uh, meeting the bridegroom. Well, the, the, the Old Testament meets the bridegroom. And, uh, and when the Old Testament meets the bridegroom in the coming of Christ, the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. So the whole of the Old Testament is made sense of by Christ. And we therefore have to read the Old Testament through Christ. And that means that the, old, the whole of the Old Testament is an allegory of Christ, of the coming of Christ, the whole covenant, the whole of the story of the Old Testament, all of the Psalms point to the coming of God uh, as man in Jesus Christ. So we have to read the Old Testament uh, as an allegory of the New Testament, the New Testament as a fulfillment of that allegory that the, to which the Old Testament points. So that's the first level of allegorical literary meaning in reading the Bible, the allegorical level. And then uh, 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 above that, uh, uh, as well as that, is the moral level. It's another allegorical level, but the moral level. So how does our understanding of the allegorical connection of the Old Testament and New Testament ref uh, uh, reflect in what I should be doing? How does this pertain to me? How does the, the, the reading of the Bible hold up a mirror to show me myself and not just show me who I am, but show me who I should be and also who I shouldn't be, a magic mirror. That's the moral level of meaning. And then the, the, the fourth level meaning, the third allegorical level is the anagogical level. And the anagogical level of meaning is that, that, that how uh, the allegorical connection from the Old and New Testament, how that shows itself to me as a magical mirror that shows me who I am, who I should be and who I shouldn't be, how all of that uh, ultimately is, is, comes to um, fulfillment and fruition in eternity. So the anagogical level is how all of this 
relates to eternity, how everything in time somehow points to eternity. So in, 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 in a, a simple sense, that the, the, what the church calls the four last things, that death, judgment, heaven, and hell, that so, somehow the reading of the Bible, should, that focus should always be there also, that we're mortal, but we are destined for eternity, either in the good place or the bad place. So we, we're mortal, death. Once we die, we will be judged. So death, judgment. And then following judgment, only two possibilities, heaven or hell. Purgatory, of course, is a one-way street to heaven. So uh, only heaven or hell. So Thomas Aquinas and Augustine both teach us of the necessity of reading uh, the Bible literarily, seeing the signifiers, seeing the allegories in it. So what, in what sense is the Bible a true mirror? Um, and all other literature is a true mirror in relation to it, relative to this. In, in other words, in to the extent that other literature reflects biblical truth, gospel truth, it's also a true mirror. And of course, not, no, no mirror is as perfectly true, capital T, capital M, as the true mirror which the Bible is, which the gospel is. So what, what, what we learn uh, about ourselves by holding up this magic mirror uh, who we are uh, and who we should be and who we shouldn't be is that we, we, we're at three aspects, three dimensions of, of who we are as human persons. Homo viator, homo superbus, and anthropos, two Latin phrases and a Greek word. We'll start actually with, um, we'll start with uh, anthropos because it's the older word. Uh, it's the Greek word for man, anthropos. And etymologists argue uh, about the the root of the word, where the word comes from originally. But Plato, and the great philosopher, and he's a good enough authority for me, said that it means he who turns upwards. So, so how do the Greeks distinguish who we are as 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 human persons from every other creature? Well, we look up, and so the way I sometimes put it is that the animal grazes, man gazes that the animal is confined and constrained by instinct, uh, we can transcend that instinct in, in the quest for that which is transcendental, in the quest for goodness, truth, beauty. We can do it in various ways. We can do it, for want of a better word, scientifically, or we can do it, for want of a better word, artistically or poetically. So we can look up at, look up at the sun, uh, obviously not presumably uh, midday without protection, look up at the sun and we can work out how far the sun is from us. We can work out how long it takes light to get to us from the sun. So we can look at it in, the, in that uh, sci scientific sense. Or we can look at the sun and uh, be astonished at its beauty and be moved to uh, to employ the imago dei, dei in us, the imagination, uh, to write a sonnet to the sun. So, for instance, at the beginning of it, at least, uh, a sonnet by Roy Campbell, To the Sun. Oh, let your shining orb grow dim of Christ the mirror and the shield, that I may gaze through you to him, see half the miracle revealed. So the poet doesn't just see the ball of gas, he sees something which signifies that the the one who created the sun and created the one who can look up at the sun and write a poem to the sun. So anthropos. And then we have homo viator. So we're now into Latin. Homo viator means man on a journey or man on a quest or man on a pilgrimage. Uh, and, and, and this is the, uh, an understanding that all of us in our individual lives are on a journey. The only purpose of life is to get to heaven. If we fail that quest for heaven, we are literally miserable losers for eternity. The quest is for heaven. We're all on a journey, homo viato. And if, if, if the quest is for heaven, it's not just a journey, of course, it's a pilgrimage. It's also a quest in the sense that we would have to fight dragons on the way. And yes, dragons exist. Most of them are inside us, in our hearts, demons Evil thoughts, th evil thoughts, temptations. And if we don't defeat the dragon, the dragon defeats us. And we can't defeat the dragon without the help of God. And we'll see how, uh, obviously, Holy Scripture shows us that. Great works of literature show us that. So homo viator, the man on the quest for heaven. Pilgrim man. 
The Bible shows us anthropos, also shows us homo viato. This is uh, uh, who we should be, right? Um, we are, but we can refuse, as we shall talk in a minute. So we should be he who looks up in wonder, in praise at the beauty of the cosmos and the beauty of the creator of the cosmos. We should be those on the appointed journey, the pilgrimage of life, the quest for heaven. But we are also, third aspect of us, homo superbus. We are proud man, man who refuses the journey. Uh, we refuse to choose the path of self-sacrificial love. We refuse to, to look up in wonder. We're too self-absorbed with our own shrinking, shriveling uh egocentrism and there's a wonderful verb which comes from a wonderful work of literature called the lord of the rings uh well he, tolkien doesn't use it as a as a, a, a verb he uses a noun that the, the character of Gollum. but the verb is to golemize that if we choose to be homo superbus instead of homo viator we are choosing to golemize ourselves we're choosing instead of growing in wisdom and virtue instead of taking the uh the, uh, the, 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 the quest for heaven, uh, we choose instead to just disappear into the smallness of ourselves, thinking we're big. That's the irony. The more that we think we're big, the more we shrivel and shrink into a pathetic wretch, pathetic wreck, a pathetic remnant of the good person or hobbit we were called to be. We become a golemized shadow of that. That's the power, that's the power of pride to destroy ourselves and destroy others. So the Bible shows us who we should be. Homo viator and anthropos, who we shouldn't be, homo superbus, and it shows us the consequences of choosing one or the other. <clears throat> As regards the relationship between, between uh, gospel truth and literary truth, there I, I, can't, I can go no better than to go back to September the 19th, 1931, to Oxford, to the rooms of C.S. Lewis in Magdalen College, Oxford, and to a long night talk, as Lewis called it, between um, uh, himself, J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, and their friend Hugo Dyson. And in that uh, long night talk, C.S. Lewis said, but myths are lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver. So myths, stories, you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Lord of the Rings, uh, that the, 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 these stories, these myths are lies and therefore they're worthless. They have no power uh, because they don't tell the truth. Even though they breathe through silver, we love them because they're beautiful, but they don't tell us the truth. And Tolkien said, no, they're not lies. He said, all myths, all stories contain splintered fragments of the one true light that comes from God. And he says that the gospel is a story like all the others except it's a true story. It's the, it's the myth that really happened, where God tells the story not with words, but with facts, and where God himself enters the story. The gospel is the true myth, the true story. And that, was, that, that understanding of reality, that understanding of, of art, literature, and truth was so powerful to C.S. Lewis that within a few weeks, he was declaring himself to be a Christian. He converted to Christianity because of that long night talk. And he said that I definitely started believing in, 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 in God and Christ. And the long night talk with Tolkien and Dyson had a great deal to do with it. C.S. Lewis learned the lesson. We need to learn the, the lesson. The authority of the Bible is that it's the true myth that makes sense of all the other myths. And to read literarily is to read reality realistically. That's the authority of the Bible. Thanks for joining me on the authority. Next time, we'll be going to look at the authority of the Beowulf poet. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. 
To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.